Our Black Ops 3 Zombies journey starts with Shadows of Evil. Shadows of Evil was the only map in the entire game that was free, so it had the job of introducing players to the way Black Ops 3 works, which was a very bold move made by the developers. If you look at the past launch maps, you can see that they were trying to ease players into the mode. Noct was the first attempt at the mode, so it made sense that it was so barren and simple. Kino worked because it reacquainted people into the mode with mechanics similarly designed to Doris, and complementing Kino was 5, a more difficult map with newer features. As for Transit, it was a more complicated map than the ones past, but the developers had the foresight to add in survival maps in case Transit was too complicated for them. And all of these survival maps were free for everyone. And then you have Black Ops 3 with only Shadows of Evil being available for everyone, and there is no simple alternative. The reason maps like Mob of the Dead and Origins work is because they're DLC. The players buying these DLC are already accustomed to the game mode, but since Shadows of Evil is a launch map and not a DLC, it does not get that luxury. But let's say you're a hardcore player that doesn't mind this, or you're someone that has learned the map. What does Shadows of Evil offer? First of all, this map's theming is the best out of any zombies map before it or after it. I generally have no idea how the fuck Treyarch managed to mix in a 1940s city with Cthulhu monsters and futuristic weaponry. Then you have the gameplay. Like I said, it's a complicated fetch quest, and I understand that it can be pretty distasteful for you to open up a guide just to know how to pack a punch, but once you get over this hurdle, you get some of the best gameplay demonstrated in Zombies history. So let's look at what's new on this map. First is the new perk, Widow's Wine. For 4000 points, you're grenades are turned into Semtex grenades, and these Semtexes pause the zombies in place. Not only that, but if you happen to get hit by a zombie, one of the grenades that you have in your inventory will immediately explode pausing the zombies around you. And by killing these paused zombies, they will drop more grenades that you can pick up. Then you have Beast Mode, a different take on Afterlife from Mob of the Dead. But unlike Afterlife, Beast Mode doesn't require you to kill yourself. And then you have the newly introduced Specialist mechanic. Specialists are wonder weapons that have unlimited ammo, but can only be used for a limited amount of time before you have to charge it up again. The Specialist weapon in Shadows of Evil is the Apothecan Sword, an infinite damage melee weapon with an extremely high radius. Its base variant comes with the ability of a slam attack, and when you upgrade the Apothecan Sword, you will replace this slam ability with a projectile that you can control. The specialist mechanic is easily one of the best regarded things in Black Ops 3, and it was a much appreciated addition. Then you have the wonder weapon, the Apothecan Servant. A black hole shooter with limited ammo, but each shot can kill multiple hordes of zombies. This wonder weapon has only one base variant, and there was an upgrade that was actually planned for it, but it was removed later on in development for being too overpowered. This was actually removed so late into development that the steps for this upgrade are still coded into the map. But if I'm being honest, it's not like the map suffers a lot from not having this upgrade. Now there's so much more to this map, like the pods and the civil protector and whatnot, but the most important feature introduced into this map was the gobblegum. Scattered around shadows of evil, are gobblegum machines, but only one of these gobblegum machines will be active at a time. Spending 500 points on a machine will dispense one gobblegum from the five that you choose before starting your game, and each gobblegum will grant you a certain ability. There are four types of gobblegum, blue, green, purple, and yellow. Blue gobblegums are passive abilities that you get for a certain amount of rounds. These rounds vary from 1 to 5. Green gobblegums are passive abilities based on real time. It could be as little as 60 seconds or as long as 20 minutes. Purple gobblegums are abilities that can be manually activated by the player. And finally yellow gobblegums, which are abilities that can be activated by fulfilling a certain condition. And finally gobblegums are separated into two categories. First is classic gobblegums. These gobblegums are acquired by leveling up your profile and they have unlimited uses as long as you don't prestige. And if you're playing the game offline, all of the gobblegums are unlocked for you. The other category is Mega Gobblegums. 
These are gobblegums only acquired via a currency called Liquid Divinium. Every time you spend points while playing zombies, you have a random chance of getting one of these Liquid Divinium. And you can use these Liquid Divinium on a slot machine to get a random Mega Gobblegum. These Gobblegums have limited uses as they have to be acquired, but they are significantly stronger than the classics. This category has three subcategories, Normal Mega Gobblegums, Rare Mega Gobblegums, and ultra rare mega gobblegums. And obviously, the rarer the gobblegum, the better that it is. For example, you can get something as useless as a licensed contractor which spawns in three carpenters, or you can get something as strong as Perkaholic, which gives you every single perk that is available on the map. This gobblegum system was probably the most well-received thing in the entire game. It adds in so much more replayability to the game mode, and while the rare Mega Gobblegums were overpowered, the only way to get them was through gameplay. And at the time, you can only get two Liquid Divinium in one game. It rewards people who grind the game, and for the people who don't care, it doesn't take away from the experience. However, this great system would deteriorate over time, and in the end of the video, you will see it turns from a great system into basically a cash grab. Finally, there is Shadows of Evil's Easter Egg. Like Origins, this Easter Egg is an incredible test of skill, but instead of it testing how good you are at memorizing the map, like Origins, it tests your skill as a zombies player. You can basically break down the entire easter egg as you killing a bunch of zombies and other boss enemies. It's incredibly well paced and well designed. Well, that is until you get into the last step of this easter egg, which is basically a giant fuck you to anyone that isn't doing this easter egg with a full squad. The last step requires three boxes to be shocked in beast mode at the same time, and one player to shock three keepers in the middle of the map. This step is only possible for player, and it's truly a shame that such an easter egg ends this way. What terrible game design. The Giant was the simple alternative to Shadows of Evil that people needed. It was the remake of the World of War Zombies map Darius, a map that was released half a decade prior to this game and was a fan favorite through and through. So when trailers of this map released alongside Shadows of Evil, people were extremely excited to see the fan favorite remastered in the new console. However, there was a problem with it, it was locked behind a paywall and it's not the same paywall that it is right now. As of the current moment, you can get the giant as a standalone DLC for only $6. But back then, that wasn't the case. The cheapest way to get this map was to buy a version of the game that was $80, which is significantly higher priced than it is right now. And if you already own the normal version of the game, the only way you were able to get it is through the Seasons Pass, which was $60. So in basic terms, you had to pay at least $20 to be be able to play this map, which is a bit excessive for one zombies map that is a remake. But in hindsight, it's a good thing that this map existed, otherwise Black Ops 3's launch would have suffered immensely. So yeah, let's take a look at it. One of the biggest changes that this map provided was double pack punch or alternate ammo types. Now I know AETs were also added in Shadows of Evil, but the reason I wanted to talk about them in this section is because it really showed the difference between this map and Darius and how we would go to high rounds. There was five of these alternate ammo types. There was turned, which would turn a zombie into a powerful ally for a limited amount of time. Fireworks, which would act as an insta-kill turret that will kill every single zombie within the area, and Thunderwall, which would activate it, would blast the zombie and any other zombie behind it out of the way. These three double pack punch upgrades have pretty much remained the same ever since launch. The other two, however, have been changed significantly. The two I'm talking about are Blast Furnace and Deadwire. These two basically act the same way. When activated, the effect will chain around the zombies and kill them. The difference is, is that Blast Furnace will chain more zombies than Deadwire but have a higher cooldown time. However, no one would ever use Deadwire because it was extremely underpowered. In fact, it would kill 4-5 to five zombies at maximum. But not only that, but the active 
activation was really buggy. Sometimes it would activate, sometimes it wouldn't activate at all, making it the only double pack a punch upgrade that is pretty much useless. But enough about double pack a punch, let's actually get into the content of the giant, which there isn't much because again, it's a remake. The map adds in two new perks that switch every single game at random, being stamina up and dead shot. It's unfortunate that you can't get two of these perks in one game, but it isn't that much of a problem because they don't make that much of a difference. The map also reintroduces the fly trap easter egg, this time giving you an award, which is the Annihilator Pistol. I don't have to tell you that this thing is really terrible, being literally outclassed by every single shotgun, sniper, and semi-automatic rifle in the game. But hey, at least they added the Wonder Waff, right? How did both of these weapons go through testing without a single issue? I, I, I just, I, uh, I, I don't know. Since the only way I can get access to the old patch notes is through Steam's community hub, you'll have to take this with a grain of salt. Because the way the patch notes are worded are so fucking infuriating. Like, what does fine-tuned weapon balance mean? It's just so stupid how it's worded, but anyway, let's just go over the significant stuff. Surprisingly, there isn't much to talk about, there's only a couple of things that are important. First of which is the ability to buy Liquid Divinium via Cot Points. The currency Cot Points was released, and you were able to buy it in a couple of different bundles, and you were able to buy Liquid Divinium with these Cot Points. Buying 3 Liquid Divinium would cost you 200 COD points, or roughly $2. Now at the time, especially for YouTubers, this was an extremely good deal, simply because of the fact that each game you play had a cap of only 2 Liquid Divinium acquired. So, this saves a significant amount of time for whatever gobblegum you wanted to get. I gotta admit man, these fucking developers know exactly, exactly how to fucking persuade people into buying shit that they don't need. Now, they did change how Liquid Divinium works later on in the game's life cycle, but I'm gonna leave that for a different section in the video. Then there was the patch to the Apothec and Servant upgrade. In the first couple weeks of the game's launch, you were able to upgrade the Apothec and Servant via a glitch. The way the upgrade worked was exactly like Revelations, but instead of getting 14 shots, you would get 25, which yeah, that is ridiculous. But unfortunately, Treyarch would completely remove this exploit, and yeah. That's it. If I happen to miss one of these patches, then please let me know in the comment section. Anyway, let's go to DLC 1. The Rise of Drac is often referred to as the perfect Call of Duty Zombies map blueprint. It basically excels at every single main factor of Call of Duty Zombies, and it's the reason why casuals and hardcore players think that this is one of the best maps ever created. And really, I could talk about how this map changed the community for an indefinite amount of time, but I'm more interested in talking about how the gameplay changed from launch date to now. Surprisingly, not a lot. The map brings back the Death Machine power up from Black Ops 1, although buffing it tremendously, making it useful on basically any round you wish to use it on. The map also brings back another specialist weapon from multiplayer in the Gravity Spikes or the Ragnarok DG4. This specialist weapon completely succeeded in showing how useless the Annihilator really was, and it's one of my personal favorite weapons to use in Black Ops 3. And finally, within the weapon department, we have the Wrath of the Ancients. This weapon is a bow that is acquired through feeding three dragons around the map with zombies. While it is a pretty effective weapon in the early rounds, being an explosive weapon that doesn't kill you and actually being good against panzers, it's really just a placeholder weapon for its four upgrades. Speaking of which, the map reintroduces the four wonder weapon system from Origins, adding in four elemental bows. And like the Origins staffs, they have a normal shot and a charge shot. There's the void bow, 
which opens up a portal that sends in a bunch of skulls and kills zombies around the area. And the skulls have infinite range, so you're capable of killing zombies across the map if they're a far enough distance. Then there's the Firebow, an explosive wonder weapon which when shot at a horde of zombies incinerates them with volcanic lava. Then there's the Wolfbow, which is basically an inferior version of the Thunder Gun. And then the strongest and the best of all is the Stormbow. The pre-patch Stormbow is quite possibly the most broken wonder weapon in Black Ops 3, which did pose kind of a problem for the map because most people would not use the other bows at all. Especially the Void Bow was so underpowered that no one in their right mind would ever build it. The Fire Bow is good, but it's completely outclassed by the Wolf Bow, so again, there's no point in using it. These two bows were so underpowered that it almost felt like a nuisance to have them with you. And ironically, these two are the most difficult and annoying to get. And finally, there's the map's Easter Egg. The Easter Egg was fun. It was simple. I wish it was a bit more difficult, but it did do some things better than the other easter eggs. For example, you don't have to do all of the bows like in Origins where you have to do all of the staffs. And, you know, you could actually do this easter egg solo. I know, right? What a revolutionary feature. And this map also adds in the first actual boss fight in Zombies. You go into an actual boss fight arena where you have to fight the giant keeper. And it's one of the best regarded boss fights in zombies still to this day. One interesting thing about this easter egg is it actually used to be a lot harder pre-patch. The step where you have to go to two different computers and play Simon Says with each computer used to be a lot harder. Because once you turn on the computers, a bunch of dogs would start spawning on you while you're inputting them. They would eventually patch it. I don't know when exactly because, you know, the patch notes are worded amazingly. But I do know that they did patch it to make it a bit easier. And honestly, I wish that they didn't. It added tension that this map severely needs because really there's no tension until the boss fight. But really, these are just tiny gripes of what is an incredible map. Even though, in my opinion, it's a bit worse than it used to be, it's still a top tier map. Out of all the time frames in between DLCs, this one is by far the most important in terms of patch notes. There's so much that happened here. First, let's go into the simpler stuff. First of all, this DLC sets in a new theme for the rest of the DLC season, which is that every single DLC from DLC 1 to onwards comes in with at least four new gobblegum. Some of them were good, some of them were completely useless, and some of them were good until they became completely useless with other new gobblegums. Anyway, the Awakening DLC comes in with four new gobblegums. The first one is Crawl Space, which allows you to turn all of the zombies around you into crawlers without doing a single shred of damage. It came in with five uses, and the only reason people would use it at a time is in a four-player co-op game if you want to build the Void Bowl. The next gobblegum is Fatal Contraption, which spawns in a death machine and has two uses. Next is the rare Mega Gobblegum and Dead Man Walking, which completely slows down the zombies to round one speed for four minutes. And finally, the only ultra rare Mega Gobblegum, Head Drama. For the remainder of the round, all damage you do to an enemy will go immediately to its critical point. Now, this actually used to be one of the best Gobblegums to run in the Keeper boss fight because it was really good against Panzers. But like I said, these Gobblegums would later be replaced with better Gobblegums in the future. The next thing they did is retroactively put the Death Machine power-ups into the previous maps, the Giant and Shadows of Evil, which was, again, pretty nice. Then they buffed both the Void Bow and the Fire Bow, making them really, really good against Panzers answers at least for the first 30 rounds. These two bows are still outclassed by shotguns in terms of killing the Panzer past round 35 and even in the Keeper boss fight. They should have made at least one of these two bows good against the Panzer indefinitely. These patches were the small patches. Let's go into the big ones. The Gobblegum machine is now usable on every single location and you can use it three times a round with an extended price every time you use it per round. And the price of these Gobblegums will increase every 10 rounds. They also completely removed the liquid divinium cap. However, unfortunately, they didn't increase the chances of you getting it. Still, this was really nice. Both of these changes increases the usage of gobblegum significantly, which is, again, for better or for worse, depending on you. And finally, the changes to the double pack punch upgrades Blast Furnace and Deadwire. Deadwire now had a significant buff where it would kill 
two times the amount of zombies on average, and the time to kill on Blast Furnace was slowed down, making all of the double pack punch upgrades have their uses. And this change was incredible. Deadwire became from pretty much useless to being the strongest double pack punch upgrade for training, and even for certain camping strategies if used correctly. Make your peace, Hellspawn. I am coming for you. Remember when Zetsubo no Shima used to be regarded as the worst map in Zombies history, being too tedious, too glitchy, unplayable? Ah, what ungrateful pieces of shit we were. I love how we didn't even think for a second that Troyer could sink lower than this, and they proceed to demonstrate how fucking wrong we were. Listen, we are about to go into this boss fight. In all seriousness though, the map at launch was filled to the brim with glitches. Now I can talk about all of the glitches that are in this map, but that really could be its own separate two hour video. So to give you an idea of how severe these glitches were, the developers had to make an entire overhaul of the game's engine just to be able to release DLC 3. The map really had it all. Broken textures, unkillable enemies, teleporting enemies, invisible enemies, death barriers left, right and center, unbalanced boss enemy spawn rate, really you could name anything and it's gonna be there. And like I said, the glitches can be its own two hour video, so let's just talk about what it offered in terms of gameplay. Setting up on this map used to be a lot worse than it is today, and the main reason for this was actually because of the prices of the doors. To open every single door on Zetsubo no Shima today, it would require 15,000 points. Back then, at launch, it would require that amount to open up everything in the bunker in only the bunker. Opening up everything back in the day would take over 20,000 points, which is absurd. Doing that with no gobble gum, dealing with spores and thrashers is unbelievably difficult. Speaking of which, the thrasher is regarded as one of the worst bosses ever created in zombies. The thrasher can spawn in as early as round three, which is fine because you have to force him to spawn at that point. But back at launch, he used to have a higher amount of health and spawn rate. The guy drains your ammo and when you kill him he doesn't give you any points. And again, in a map where you have to spend over 20,000 points to basically have everything opened up, it makes for a very miserable early round experience. Also to my genuine surprise, when I got a ray gun out of the box and started shooting him expecting it to kill him immediately, the guy was taking more than a clip to kill with a ray gun on round nine. What? Now you can chalk this up by saying that the ray gun is terrible, which it is on this game, but at least the ray gun is effective against the Margua. Now he can be easily killed by shotguns in the first 30 to 40 rounds, but again, back at launch when he had such a ridiculous spawn rate, people were forced to use wall powers, perkaholics, or at least an emulation to be able to deal with the thrasher. And again, past round 40, the only way to deal with him effectively is through the wonder weapons. First of which is the specialist weapon, the Skull of Nonsapwe. This weapon is extremely powerful. So powerful in fact that they had to nerf the thing. Fun fact, before Treyarch nerfed the doors and the thrasher's spawn rate, they nerfed this thing first. Yes, you heard me right, Treyarch thought it was more appropriate to nerf the wonder weapon than it was to nerf the other things that were plaguing the map. Treyarch, what fucking geniuses you were, holy shit. Anyway, the way the skull works is that once you click on it, anything in front of you will just disintegrate. The other wonder weapon that they added is a personal favorite of mine, the KT-4. If you shoot it once at a zombie, it will make the zombie explode. But if you fully charge it and shoot it on the ground, any zombie that goes through this puddle will also explode. Like Patrick or the Smith Plays put it, it's basically a silico fire with a fire staff charge. It's also one of the most effective weapons to kill the thrasher with. And when you 
shoot a spore with the KT4, instead of it making you cough, it actually makes you have a speed boost, which is pretty cool. The KT4 can also be upgraded into the Mazumune, which increases its effectiveness per shot. Now, getting the normal KT4 is nothing substantial. You just kill a zombie on a certain location and you get a part from him. You get a certain plant from underwater and then you get some spider venom. Again, nothing difficult. But the upgrade is a bit of a hassle. First thing you have to do is do a boss fight with a giant spider. And this boss fight is well received even to this day. It's one of the best boss fights in Black Ops 3, definitely. One of my favorite things about this boss fight is you don't really need any setup to do it. You can basically get in here with non-upgraded weapons and jug and you'll be completely fine. You just have to dodge some, a couple of attacks and you're good. And once you finish the boss fight, you get the KT4 part and free Widow's Wine. The second thing you have to do is you have to get rainbow water from the sewer pipe and then you have to water this seed underwater with this rainbow water. Then you have to water this seed underwater with this rainbow water three more times and once you finish watering the seed underwater with this rainbow water, you can finally get the last part for the KT4 after finishing watering the seed underwater with rainbow. The last part requires you to do the challenges at the altar. Now, if you're playing with teammates, you and your teammates have to do these challenges. Otherwise, you cannot complete this quest. This is awful. It wouldn't be that much of a problem if the challenges weren't so fucking dumb. Granted, some of these challenges are pretty easy, like for example, shoot five spores, but there are other challenges like getting a fruit, or killing thrashers before they become enraged, or killing a zombie before it becomes a thrasher. These challenges are terrible. And this with the glitches honestly just makes me believe that Treyarch did not test this map whatsoever. Thankfully the KT4 is a good wonder weapon and it's a ton of fun to use. Finally there's the map's easter egg. Now this easter egg is actually pretty short, but a couple of steps on this easter egg are just so irritating to do. One of the steps requires you to go into an electrified zip line and jump at the right moment to get a cog. This step is fun, but again you have to do the challenges for you to be able to do the step. And the other irritating step is the one where you have to use anywhere but here to go into a certain unaccessible location of the map. Now I don't hate this step, but I have to use a gobblegum slot, which is again really irritating. I wish there was like a mini easter egg that you can do to get a free anywhere but here, but unfortunately Treyarch didn't playtest this fucking map. And finally, there's the Takio boss, which is, I mean, it's okay. It's not bad or it's amazing. It's just, you know, it's mildly entertaining. I think that's the best way I can put it. However, finishing this easter egg does grant you a free perkaholic and a new training and camping area. Now, as of today, I love Zetsubo, one of my favorite maps of all time. It's a map that rewards patience and good point rationing. But at launch, dude, it was way too much. The Eclipse DLC comes in with the worst lineup of gobblegums in the entire game, first of which is unbearable. While holding this gobblegum, if you happen to get a teddy bear from the box, the box doesn't leave and can be used for a couple more uses. I don't know why this gobblegum doesn't just lock that box down permanently. I don't know, maybe it could be too overpowered. Next up is the rare mega gobblegum temporal gift. For one full round, the gobblegum allows time drops like double points and insta kills to last 30 seconds longer. Next is another rare mega gobblegum, fear in headlights. Once activated for two minutes, any enemy within your field of vision will be completely stopped in place. Now people mainly use this gobblegum in the flag step in Shadows of Evil, but other than that, it's pretty much pointless. And finally, the ultra rare mega gobblegum secret shopper. For 10 minutes, all wall buys around you turn into ammo caches, where basically you can fill up ammo for any weapon in your inventory except for wonder weapons. Like I said, this lineup is basically liquid divinium opening fodder. Anyway, enough about the gobblegums, let's go into the weapons now. First of which is something that I mentioned earlier, which was the nerf of the skull of Nonsapwe. They increase the ammo consumption per second and they also increase its cooldown time. Now the nerf isn't too terrible, but like I said, this was nerfed in the first two weeks of the map's release and the doors were not nerfed until 
mid-June. On the bright side though, they buffed the Wonder Waff tremendously. Now it works like it's supposed to. They still left the Annihilator unchanged though, which is really weird. There's also the new weapons added into Zetsubo no Shima. There's four of them. The Razorback, MX Grand, HG-40, and the Marshall 16's dual wield. Something I find very interesting about this is that they were never retroactively added into the previous maps like Black Ops 4. And it's a shame too, because weapons like the Marshalls and the MX Grand would have been pretty cool in the previous maps. I do have a feeling that these weapons were planned to put back in the previous maps, because if you go into the giant, you can actually get the razor back via console commands. Also, around this time in May, there was a rampant glitch in multiplayer. Sometimes players would spawn in with a gun model of the M27 being incapable of shooting or meleeing other players. This M27 model was in the game files all the way back in the beta. It along with the MP7 and the Remington 870. Interestingly enough, you can actually get access to the M27 on Der Eisendrack, again using the console commands. You can even get an upgraded version of the thing, and it's actually pretty powerful. But the MP7 and the R870 unfortunately are nowhere to be seen. It would have been pretty cool to see these weapons in zombies, but again, unfortunately that was never the case. It has been known by many names, but I know it as Spellingrad. In time, I don't think I've ever seen the community be so skeptical about a map's release from just the trailers. A lot of people, mostly the casual community, were talking shit about the trailers, saying that Zombies was so far out of its depth and getting into realms that it shouldn't be in, and it should be a lot more simplistic. Looking back, it's so ironic how this map turned out to be arguably the simplest original Zombies map in Black Ops 3. And arguably the best map in Black Ops 3. GK is simply remarkable. The map plays very differently to the other Black Ops 3 counterparts, being more akin to Black Ops 1 style of gameplay. This map plays similarly to Ascension and Doris, but with the way content is presented on this map, it feels more like a Black Ops 3 map. The bareness Necessities, power, pack a punch, and the wonder weapon are very simple and easy to get. And the complicated stuff like the shield and the specialist aren't required for the player, but getting them provides a great advantage. But if you wish to learn them, it doesn't take a lot. Now you can see most of what I said about the Ryzen Drac, but what I think sets this map apart from the Ryzen Drac is the difficulty. Garad is one of the most difficult maps on Black Ops 3 compared to DE, which is really easy. One of the main factors as to why is the wonder weapon, the Rega Mark III. The Mark III is really powerful, and when used in camping spots, it's dumb OP, at least until it drops off. The way the drop off works is similar to the Paralyzer from Buried, but it happens at a much much earlier round. The specialist weapon, the Gauntlet of Siegfried, is really overpowered as well. Probably the best specialist weapon in Black Ops 3, but it is also the most difficult specialist weapon to get in Black Ops 3. Another thing this map has is its bosses. There's two new bosses on this map. The first is the Mangler. While the Mangler is slow, he has a cannon that shoots a laser with homing capabilities. And he could pose a problem for you if you don't take him out quickly. I really like the Mangler. He adds a lot to this map and he fits really well into it. I really can't say the same thing about the Valkyrie though. The Valkyries are quite possibly the worst boss in Black Ops 3, especially at the launch of this map when their spawn rate was significantly more sporadic. The Valkyrie tends to shoot you from extremely far away, they're extremely nimble, and they have pinpoint accuracy. I just wish they were replaced with something cooler, but that's honestly the only major complaint that I have about this map. And finally, there's the map's easter egg. Now, there is one complaint that I do have about this and that's the valve step. Pausing a game to open up a website just to do an easter egg is really stupid. But other than that man, this easter egg is just fantastic. And it ends with one of my personal favorite boss fights in zombies. Trying to go out of my way to find things I hate about this map is hard and that's why this section in particular is extremely short in comparison to the others. However, this map made a rampant issue in Black Ops 3 significantly worse.
At this point in time, 7 months have passed and 3 DLC maps have been released. And people started to notice something about Black Ops 3 that was way different than the previous games. There was no new perks. We have not gotten a new perk since Shadows of Evil's Widow's Wine, and we haven't gotten an extra perk in our inventory since Derizendrax Electric Cherry. Some perks, like PhD and Vulture's 8, took in the form of Gobblegum, PhD taking the form of the Gobblegum Danger Closest, and Vulture 8 technically taking the form of In Plain Sight. This was heavily criticized due to it turning the entire perk into a scuffed temporary buff. This clearly was not enough, we needed more perks. So some people took the liberty of making a new fan-made perk, Banana Colada. This perk takes advantage of the slide mechanic in Black Ops 3, and the way it works is once you slide, you leave a trail behind you. And what this trail does is makes zombies slip to death. While the perk doesn't sound very practical, it's still a cool perk nonetheless. So cool, in fact, that some people, like Madgaz, took it a step further and actually made designs for perk bottles, the perk machine, and even a fucking perk jingle. And funny enough, Treyarch listened and actually put this ability in the game, but with a twist. It's a gobblegum. <laughs> The Mega Gobblegum Slaughter Slide allows you to create a giant explosion when you slide into the horde of zombies. The way the Gobblegum works is condition-based, so even if you slide normally, accidentally, it will still activate. And there's only five uses for this and the Gobblegum will disappear. As you may guess, it's very impractical and no one ever uses it. Next is the Mega Gobblegum Disorderly Combat, which is basically time-based gun game for five minutes. While this Gobblegum can be fun, it's again, very impractical. Next is the actual good Gobblegum. The rare Mega Gobblegum Crate Power, a condition-based Gobblegum that pack-a-punches whatever you get from the box. And finally, the ultra-rare Mega Broken Gobblegum Shopping Free. For one full minute, every single purchase is free. Remember earlier when I said Gobblegums get progressively more overpowered over the DLCs? Yeah, now we're getting into the ridiculous stuff. Shopping Free can basically skip over 60 to 100% of a map's progression depending on how you use it and what map you're using it on. But really, this Gobblegum is nothing compared to the later two DLC. Other than the four Gobblegum, the game also introduces seven new weapons. The Multi-Rocket Launcher L4 Siege, the FAMAS Assault Rifle, also known as the FFAR, and the fan favorite SMG, the PPSH-41. The other four are melee weapons acquired via the time attack mechanic introduced in Gorod Krovi. Every five rounds, the game gives you a melee weapon. The condition is, you have to complete these five rounds under a certain amount of time. Finishing 5 rounds in under 5 minutes will give you the wrench, finishing 10 rounds in under 13 minutes will give you the malice, finishing 15 rounds in under 24 minutes will give you the slash and burn, and finishing round 20 in under 32 minutes will give you the fury song. Now I do like this mechanic a lot, the problem that I have with it though is that these weapons take up a weapon slot, which really takes away all of their usefulness. It's still a pretty cool mechanic though. Finally there is a couple of patches that I want to talk about. First of which the thrasher's spawn rate has been significantly toned down, and they also nerfed the valkyrie making instakill work against it. But they did also also buff its damage against the shield. I really don't understand the purpose as to why, but hey, at least they nerfed the thrasher's spawn rate, thank god. Man, where do I even begin? This map was hyped up since the beginning of Gorod Krovi's launch. The amount of anticipation people had for this map before even trailers came out was probably more than any hype generated by any map before it, and probably any map after it. The only other map I can think of that had more anticipation than it is probably Blood of the Dead. Some of the predictions that people had for this map before it even came out were so off, it's hilarious. People were expecting a giant war, 
the staffs were gonna come back, the map will have no glitches, it will have a new perk finally introduced on the last map. Unfortunately, hope and denial can only get you so far. So we're just stuck with this. I genuinely have no idea if the developers intended for the map to be like this, but I'm not here to discuss that. Let's see what we have. The premise of the map is something the community has been talking about for a couple of years. The idea of combining old maps together into one large map is great and it's something that not a lot of franchises can even do. But this idea was executed in quite possibly the most boring way imaginable. The maps that they picked don't have a consistent reason to be there and you don't even interact with the maps most of the time. It honestly feels like they rolled the dice when picking these maps and apathetically taped them together into one large circle. And even the locations that they picked for these maps make no sense to me. Why use the generator 3 area from Origins where you could have used the podium room or the crazy place. Why pick the cafeteria from Mob of the Dead where you should have used the bridge? And like I said, you cannot interact with most of this stuff. You can't interact with the pack punch pad from Shangri-La, the four buttons from Shangri-La, or the generator from Origins. The only thing that they really nailed is the setting and feel. One of my favorite things about this map is when you end the round in a certain area and then while the round is changing you go to another certain area, the round change music of both maps merge together to be one. Here listen to this. And when you look at the scenery outside of the map you're in, it really does feel like a dimensional calamity. But you only get that feeling for basically the first 10 minutes of playing this map. The problem with Revelations is that the assets are there, they're just not being used. It feels like I'm playing in an asteroid field with modded textures. I mean, just look at this map's easter egg for example. The steps are random, incohesive, and pointless. Why does bringing a keeper to a certain rock gives you a fucking recording? And why when you get two more recordings doing two other random steps, summon a fucking drone? And you do all that random shit to go into a reused boss fight? Nah. And it's not like it's even a good boss fight either. Every time you shoot him once, he goes back and he does a random emote. And you have to keep doing that shit until he fucking press F on a book. And to top this all off, this map's stability at launch was probably worse than any DLC Zombies map before it or after it. It's really sad to see how much momentum this map had, only for it to be crashing down at terminal velocity. I don't know if this map was held back by the story, but what this map should have been is a chaotic battle with a giant weapon sandbox. Why is the Apothecan Servant and the Thunder Gun the only two wonder weapons on this map? They really should have added every single Black Ops 3 wonder weapon onto this map. That way, every single player would have at least two wonder weapons. And really, it wouldn't have changed the difficulty much because the map is already one of the easiest zombies maps ever created. Hell, what they could have done is add in every single boss from Black Ops 3 and put them on this map. The map will be a lot more chaotic, which would have made it a lot more fun. Sadly, all we can do is imagine how great this map could have been. But at last, that's what we got. The Salvation DLC comes in with six new gobblegums. One normal, one rare, and four ultra rare mega gobblegums. You have the mega gobblegum mind blown which explodes all of the zombies' heads within your field of vision, and the rare Mega Gobble Gum Bullet Boost, which double pack punches your weapon. Now, Mind Blown is useless, and Bullet Boost can be used in certain situations, but obviously the main focus of this DLC is the four ultra-rare OP Gobble Gum that we got. Let's start off with the weakest one out of them, Profit sharing. For 10 minutes, any points acquired by any player will duplicate and be given to the other players. While a lot of conditions need to be met for this to have its best effects, your entire team could be set up by round 8 just by using this gobblegum alone. Next up is round robin, which allows you to skip any round regardless of what round it is. Next up is self-medication. 
This allows you to revive yourself with all of your perks back, including Quick Revive. And if you happen to not have Quick Revive, you're still able to revive yourself. The only condition is, is that you have to kill a zombie while down. And finally, there's Near Death Experience. Near Death Experience works differently depending if you're playing solo or co-op, but it's fine because both of these abilities are equally as broken and ridiculous. In solo, for 5 rounds, you're basically invulnerable, as long as you have Quick Revive. How it works is that when you die, you get all of your perks back, including Quick Revive. So when you die again, you also get all of your perks back, including Quick Revive. Giving you an infinite amount of downs with an infinite amount of revives, with all of your perks back every single time. And this will go on as long as you have the Gobblegum. The co-op version of the Gobblegum allows you to skip the revive animation altogether and just instantly revive a teammate, or vice versa. And you get all of your perks back, again, for five full rounds. You know, this Gobblegum is so broken that it basically nullifies any boss fight and a lot of the hard steps, like the Valkyrie Escort for example. Now let's get into the patches, which there isn't many. Most of it is just fixing a lot of Revelations problems and just making it a much more stable map. But there is one noteworthy patch that I want to talk about, and that is the nerf to the electric bow. They made it so that the bow loses a lot of its effectiveness after round 30. Anyway, that's all there is to the patches. Let's go into the weapons that they added. There's 9 of them. 4 new melee weapons via the time attack mechanic introduced back into Revelations. There's the Nunchucks, the Skull Splitter, the Buzz Cut, and the Nightbreaker. There's also a 5th wonder weapon called the Path of Sorrows, but this one you have to get through a different method through a side easter egg. This is the Takio Katana that we wanted to use since the beginning of Black Ops 3, and the developers had such disinterest in introducing this weapon that they just ported the thing from the black market. Anyway, four other weapons were added. There's the M1927 returned from Black Ops 2, the Peacekeeper Assault Rifle from the Black Market, the Banshee from the Black Market, and the Rift E9 from the Black Market. And that's pretty much it for the end of the Black Ops 3 life cycle. Now, I didn't talk about Chronicles in this video because I think it deserves its own video. I could make one in the future, but let's just see how this video performs.